Thanks very much. I'm Kim from the Goat Shed in Australia. G'day and welcome. welcome oh, um, there we go. We're a bit better now. So we're just going to start off. My friend and colleague Graham and mentor can't be here. He can't travel. Uh, so we've just made a short presentation. Uh, you'll watch. It goes for about 16 or 17 minutes. So let's sit back and watch and see what Graham's got to say. Well, hello to everyone at Pinball Expo number 40. Here we are, all the way down under here in Australia at the Goat Shed, in our home in Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia. And we're just showing you the back deck where we do all our training. That's the table we've got set up for the training, the television for the um, presentations, and we even have a mini commercial kitchen and everything here. Now this was used just yesterday. We had a our pin fest over the weekend, very successful. I think we raised roughly very close to twenty five grand for a, a charity. All right. Let's have a look. It's not a bad day here today. The sun's out. Here's the side of the goat shed uh, that we had made. That little annex was built last year, June or July. There's the side door into the shed. Over there, let's just go around the front, have a look and see what we can see. And this is what people see when they walk down toward the shed. There's the big barn doors we had built. Right up the top there, you can see a goat somewhere up there <laughs> really cool eh and now we'll just head into the shed this is where all the machines come into the shed have a look here here's the lightning ball we're currently restoring there's our big goat shed sign that we had made by our our artist Linda um, that's that area there, so we can store a few machines up there. A couple of machines that we've got underway, the motorboard out of one there, pro football. There's the front of this lightning ball. Looking really good. Wonderful, in fact. And we've got some storage shelves up there, which we've got legs up there at the moment. We've really got to sort that out a bit more. So, just a few parts and things over there. All sorts of different things. We've done videos on those before. We won't bore you people with them. Um, there's another workbench we have there. And let's walk out into the main shed. There's a ramp here now. We, we had this doorway built. There used to be a door just here that we had that filled in, a ramp built, so we can wheel machines up like this here. We've got a jungle princess there on wheels so we can move it around easily let's just come in that's just arrived for repair ready for assessment we're going to do a video on that soon and very very quickly there's all our touch-up paints oh there's an old trade stimulator our grinder and we've got another workbench over here with a drill press on it and a few other things there's our spare parts department all in there all our new parts live in there and there's all our our rubbers all right so there's graham sitting down getting ready for a day's work yeah another big day in the gut shed yeah excellent um graham um why don't you tell the people a bit about yourself uh, yeah first off i'm welcome to expo hope you're having a great time um, I first got in the pennies back in the mid-60s when I was just a young bloke, of course. Back in around 65, 66, um, because I've got three older brothers, 
they always um, used to go to the pinball arcades and I used to hang along. I could barely um, see over the machine, so we used to stand on an old um, wooden Coca-Cola box and watch my brothers playing. Um, if they want a free game, they might give me a, a one or two balls to play with them. And after that, I they sort of went their own way when they got older and I was, you know, I, I just kept playing pinball machines from there on, um, right into my teens, having a great time. And um, playing the local horns, I learnt, especially on holidays, we'd go away and there'd be pinball machines everywhere, um, which was good. I learnt everything about the machines, like the names of them, uh, when they were coming out, what year they were made, just when I was a teenager. And even now today, Kim says, oh, what game's that? And just from the cabinet or anything, I just tell them what it is and what year, which works out good. And anyway, so um, come around about, oh, around about 1985, I, I forgot about pinballs for a few years because I remember back in the late 70s when they started to go solid state. I did like them to start with, but they just didn't have the same feel. And I still like them today, but um, personally, I like the old EMs. And um, they didn't have the sand, and I sort of like died off. And plus, I got my first car, and I started you know, going out with women and whatever and lost the plot there for a minute. And then about, as I said, 85, I was away on holidays, and... Um, there was a Comet pinball machine in, in a um, hamburger shop. And my girlfriend said, oh, I said, you used to like pinball. I said, yeah. I said, why don't you go and have a quick game? I said, oh, righto. So I went in there and had a quick game. And um, and it was absolutely fantastic because like, nothing like the early solid states has sort of come in, into their own. And I got back into it, but I wasn't determined to get one of them. I said, I want something old because that's what I grew up. And that's what I knew. So I went to the paper, the classified ads the next day and, uh, Looking for more more pinball machines, and there was hundreds. It was everywhere, cheap as, hundred bucks, fifty bucks, and um, they say just come and get it. And I seen one ad stood out particular in Sydney. It said uh, amusements, then it said um, pinball machines, and then it said bingo machines. I said, oh, bingos! I like playing bingos. I used to play them in the, in the mid seventies. Lost a lot of money, of course, but um, no, I was fascinated by them. So anyway, long story short, I went down to Sydney. Bought me bingo machine, come home, and I had to learn how to fix it on my own because there was no one, not a person. I couldn't get past, couldn't get rubbers, no nothing. All I'd done when the guy, when I was bought it off the guy and I was leaving the shop, he said, oh, I said, oh, you got any schematics for it? And he said, oh, Graham, you're the first person that's ever asked me that. I said, righto. So this is 85. So he, he said, oh, I hope you do well with it because he thought I was going to put it out on site. He said, no, no, I'm putting this in my lounge room at home. <laughs> I'm going to play it. <laughs> and anyway, so um, anytime there's a problem, I looked at the book, looked at the schematics and sort of nutted it out. And sometimes it might take me a week just to find a little problem and fix it, whereas now, you know, basically pick it up straight away. But because I had the passion, I had wanted to learn, and I did learn. And then um, my girlfriend said, oh, how about we get a pinball machine now because she wanted to play pinballs. And I said, righto. And then it just started with that, and I got pinball machines, and they didn't seem as complicated as the bingos, and um, just picked it up better, like just just basic things like score or sticking and whatever. It was at the stage where you could buy a pinball machine for next to nothing. So any machine that has some possibility I worked on, any machine that was buggered, I used to just strip for parts because you couldn't get parts. Couldn't get a flipper core, couldn't get anything. And I sort of gradually over the years built my parts up a bit, and then... Um, Unfortunately, around the same time, I started getting really sick with me um, with my kidneys. I had kidney problems, and anyway, so in 1990, I retired due to illness, and um, I still was buying pinball machines, but I was so sick that they just stayed in the shed, and I couldn't do nothing to them. And then um, I got better. I had a had a um, a kidney transplant around '93, and I got better within the next six months, and I. Sort of got back into fixing pennies and me on my own, just sort of took my own time. And, and then around oh, probably late 94, I met a, another friend who does machines, not, doesn't live not, not far from the goat shed. And um, we went out together fixing machines probably 10 years every day. He would learn off me and I would learn off him. He was more a solid state guy, but I still done a bit on the solid state. But when we used to fix an EM, that was great. And, I, and, and um, so after a while, probably... It petered off a little bit around about the early 2000s and um, he sort of had enough of it and he gave me a lot of his parts. And then after that, I just slowed down a little bit, just done machines like people ring up, oh, you fix them? Yeah, right, I bring one over and I just take my time and do it. And it's nothing like it is now. 
So, um, but in between that, around about the year 2000, I was approached by Marco Rosganoli. He said, he got his number off such and such to, um, he said to come around because he's just starting on his first book, which we um, have here somewhere. That was his first book. Apparently it's the best selling pinball book in the world. It's in its third print and it's still going strong. So um, he come around just to take some photos of the machines. I think I had about 10 lined up in a, in a row here in the goat shed. Of course, we didn't have all the benches and that we do have now. My, my dad built that later on. And um, he was fascinated. Done a few photos. And I got the name really good. And then um, not long after he finished his first book, he said, oh, because I helped him a bit. And I knew a lot about pinballs. He said, you know, what year was this? And I tell him, and we're, we're looking up any um, records. And so he knew, well, he knew a fair bit, just off the cuff. And um, he really needed someone to help him with the photos because he had his, um, his wife was helping at the time and um, she was busy with work and a lot of the pictures that we needed were in a state. So we'd go to Queensland and away out of state and we'd go to Queensland and um, oh, down, down, down our south a bit. But, and so I helped him on his second book, uh, Pinball Memories, just with the photos and and sometimes I'd, you know, he'd, he'd be writing something. I said, I'll just chuck this line in to see how you're going. And I already had wrote a couple of articles for Pinball um, magazines and whatever. And um, he said, oh, how about you coming on the next book afterwards? And I said, yeah, righto. So we um, we sort of work at a layer. It's gonna, they were going to be different from the books that he'd done. So it's sort of like going to be um, 50 machines, you know, different eras little bit about each and um, do it that way and so so we got we um, sent out a thing to Sheffer to do a three book series and they wrote back and said oh it sounds pretty good um, send us a sample chapter and we did and they said yeah yeah that's, that's we'll give you the green light to go ahead but um, we're only going to have two books for now and um, that was okay because once you realize the amount of work that goes into them when you two books it really does take a lot of time and um, so I think we've done them probably around 2002 to 2007 just to get two books out, which is a fair whack of time. Mm. So anyway, so here's the, here's the two books that we've done with Marco. This first one was uh, Pinball Snapshot, which is um, just a basic collection of machines. Um, they're not all EM, they cover everything. Oh, there's a Spanish Eyes. Yeah, so we've done everything like that. And, and they're still, still out there. You can get them through uh, Shepherd Publishing or Amazon, I suppose, you can get them there. Yeah, I think you get them off of Amazon. Yeah. yeah. But um, back in the day, it's very exciting. This is the second one. So Pinball Perspectives. Perspectives. Very colourful books. And, Graham, did you not have a photograph of you and Marco I back did. in the early days? Have I you got that there? We'll show the... I you found one? I found this photo um, the other day while I was going through one of my old cupboards. Yeah. And um, just as I said, just as Marco finished his first book, we went down to Sydney um, to do to other photos. And while we were down there, I was visiting my brother's place, and he was getting married soon. And um, my brother knew that Marco is a good photographer. So he said, oh, how about you do um, our wedding photos just coming up in about a month's time? And so I said, Mark, I agree, and said, yeah, that'd be good. And um, and so, actually, I was the best man at the wedding, at my brother's wedding, and uh, went down there, and here's a, a random photo that his, um, his wife at the time took. Let's have a look. My goodness. We're just like twins. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, so, um, actually, I still look pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so, Graham, um. I guess, you know, it was a lot of fun writing those books with Marco and yeah. everything like that. And it's, you know, what, 20 odd years back now. But yeah, yeah. Um, while I'm in America, mm. what do you, what do you, what do you plan on doing? Are you going to have a, a vacation or are you going to work? Well, I know in the last couple of times you went away, nothing much changes. It's just that I, I might get up half an hour earlier, but even then I might set the alarm half an hour, still wake up at the same time. I'm an absolute shocker. And so I, I come down here and just um, plot along and um, we've got so much work. We just got a jungle princess in and a, a jungle queen. 
And so we're doing a bit of work. So we might get one working before Kim's away, goes away. But um, apart from that, we've got a dropper card play pool coming in to get stripped down for painting. So we've got to take the parts off the top and the bottom and basically just leave um, maybe the common on the play field underneath for the, for the GI and other things. And um, we're still doing work, of course, on the lightning ball. That's got a lot of hardware just on the front of the door and, and um, the knocker and the bell and all that sort of stuff. And I can put the motor board in and put the, I've got to finish rubbing back the top, the head. Then I can put the, um, all the mechanics of the back box in and set that all up. I've got to do the wood, but it's going to be a slow process. Well, you, you've got a fair bit to do. Yeah. And, and Graham, where, where do you see the future of electromechanical pinball heading? Well, electromechanical pinball, I think the hobby for EMs is getting bigger. Of course, um, I know even people that have got, you know, 20 machines, late model machines, they always talk to have one EM and oldie in there. And um, it's getting to the stage now where they're getting harder, they get, they're getting they more expensive. And um, But they're going, going to get high enough where people won't buy them. So our days of buying wrecks for a couple of hundred dollars and doing them up are pretty well gone. You can't find them anymore. So um, a lot of people bring wrecks out here and we sometimes have to knock them back because they're just so bad to work on. But I think the future could only get better. Um, more people making spare parts extra you know, for the machines. And like I know back even the late 90s, if a machine that had a bad play forward and a bad backlash, you could pretty well just guarantee you could, you'd wreck it because there's no way it's going to look good enough to sell. But nowadays, basically, no matter what machine, you can still bring back to, um, to how it should be. And so I think... It's going to get better. There's going to be more companies bringing out parts that we need. And there could be some retro, like, EM machines made. Companies you just don't know. Yeah, that's that's very, very true. And, um, look, I think that gives everyone a great insight mm. into, into yourself and a little bit about. So I'll yeah. continue the talk live now. And we're going to talk about the future of electromechanical pinball in the goat shed and where we see things happening and some of the things that we're going to be doing to help keep that alive. So, Graham, thanks very much for that. And um, that's that's just great. So there we go. There's a... There's a... Oh, yes, yeah, Spanky's a... girlfriend is there, Skanky. She's a dirty girl. Yeah, yeah, uh, she's a bit dirty at the moment. And Spanky's away getting a spruce up for the expo. Yeah, he's getting a full makeover. Okay, so that's Graham, and, and this is Spanky, by the way, and he did have his full makeover. Um, so that's our mascot. A lot of people think we're mad, but it just uh, goes with the saying with the goat shed. Okay, well, you've heard a little bit about Graham, um, probably a little bit about myself. Um, my name's Kim Oswald. Um, I've only been repairing pinball machines for the last almost 10 years. Um, I fell into this by pure accident. I wasn't going to do pinball. It wasn't an intention of mine. I was going to build a model railroad and be be done with it in my house, in my garage. And a friend of mine asked me one day, would I have a look at a pinball machine? And I said, hey, I know how to play them, but I don't know how to fix them. Anyway, he said, I can't find anyone. And he begged and begged and bought me beers and that sort of done it. So I, I went and had a look at it and miraculously I was able to repair it. Um, and I thought, oh, this is okay, and he had other problems with the machine, and this guy wasn't real good at finding people, so I said, look, I'll find out who can do this for you, and I went to the Newcastle Pinball Association and spoke to them, and they said, look, you go and see this guy, Graham McGuinness, he will do it. So I went and met Graham, and um, by then I'd sort of, my interest in pinball had ignited, and I decided to buy a couple of machines, which I did, and... Uh, I met Graham and said, this dude here needs his pinball fixed. Can you help him? He said, sure, sure. And I said, look, I've just bought two and I'm interested in learning how to fix them. And he sort of looked at me because no one had ever, ever, ever asked him that before. And um, he said, well, um, you know, what background have you got? And I said, look, I'm a, I'm a, I've done 45 years in the office machine business. I, I started off as a typewriter mechanic and fixed mechanical adding machines, accounting machines, duplicating machines, offset printing machines, you name it, photocopiers, we used to fix it. And 
they were all like small mechanical devices and electromechanical. So he said, oh, that's interesting, you know, and he showed me a few things. And so we, we sort of got together. So uh, it was an interesting start to it for sure and certain. Um, so all up, I've had about 55 years electromechanical experience. Um, perhaps I should retire now, but I'm feeling old. Um, this is my third trip to the USA. I'm happy to be here again. Met met and made so many friends over here. It's fantastic. The pinball community is is very good, very close knit and friendly. Um, we um, I've been retired now ten years. Last September, the 30th September. So I actually forgot all about it. I was I was in San Diego the day I'd actually retired ten years. So that was a bit of a an achievement that I missed out on. But it doesn't matter, I'm here at the moment. Um, so when I said this to Graham about getting together, we actually ended up, that was 2013. I retired in 2014. And it probably wasn't until about 2015 that I sort of got together with him and we, we started off slowly and had a few machines and um, we sort of didn't have any and then he had a restoration on. He does excellent artwork he draws up his own stencils and things like that and he paints them and I hate all that sort of stuff but he's very artistic so he's really good at that and away we went so what we ended up doing was um the way the goat shed came about was there was an advertisement on the television simply and a guy had a goat and they called it spanky and we thought that was a good name and we were looking for a name and we said goats are fun let's call it the goat shed so that's how that sort of came about. Um, the um, our, our whole philosophy in this is to try and keep these classic old pinball machines going for future generations, because if we don't keep them going, they're going to disappear, and that that would be a tragedy. Um, I first played my first pinball machine in about 1963. I was 10 years old. Uh, and it was a game called Tropic Isle, a game by Gottlieb, which was manufactured in March 62. And so by the time we saw it in Australia, I was 10. And I've got one of those games now. I love it. Um, and um, it's been fully restored by Graham and myself. And we even put a new, brand new NOS playfield in it earlier this year, which we bought from the States. So um, that's sort of how I got into it. Um, and here we are now. Um, I, uh, I have a birthday next week, so this will be my third birthday in the USA, and I'll turn 71. So this is the whole point of this talk tonight. We, we're talking about the future, where it's going to go. I'm, I'm getting old. I got into this hobby quite late, but we'll talk about that a little later on, where we feel we can make improvements and do things to keep this all going. Um, most of you here may or may not know that we have our own Facebook group called The Goat Shed EM Pinball Repair Specialist. And we have our own YouTube channel, which is simply called Goat Shed EM Pinball Repair Specialist. Um, is everyone aware of that? Or a lot of, a lot of people have approached me. Thank you. A lot of people have approached me over the last couple of days and thanked us for their videos, which is very humbling. We're not here to make money. We do charge people. It's it's our hobby. It's our passion. And um, we want to keep this passion rolling forward if we can. And um, we get involved in um, these videos to train. They're short and sweet mostly. And they're specific about how to pull things apart and put them back together. Um, I mean, I'm not. No, none of us here can really say that we got taught by Gottlieb or Bally or Williams because there's no one around to do it. Uh, I know I'm self-taught. Um, I've learned a lot off my mentor, Graham, and he's learned a lot off me. I've, I've been able to show him the skills I learned in office equipment that reflect in pinball machines, particularly with step units, which are exactly the same as an escapement unit in a typewriter, which makes the carriage move from right to left. So that's the, when I saw that, that's the, uh, how would I say, the what was one of the catalysts? I thought, oh, this is cool. You know, like, I, I'm going to enjoy this. And I, I really do. We we both enjoy fixing pinball machines every day. Um, with our uh, Facebook group, we, we seem to be growing. There, there's, there's, there's about six or seven EM Facebook groups out there. There's the original EM Pinball, which has got about 7,000-odd members. 
there's ours where we're approaching 5,000 members and there's a few others there that that uh, that exist uh, and a guy just started another one just recently too actually um, so our YouTube you know we've got around about um, just under 2700 subscribers which is fine when we started we thought mm, if we get 10 subscribers we'll be happy so I think we've had that going now for about five years and um, as long as YouTube leave the f them on there, the, the, the tutorials, it'll be good for future generations to come. And um, we've even had our YouTube videos um, linked up to um, PinWiki. There's some of them there, not all of them. Some of them you can go and see if you want to see about how to you go and read PinWiki, which is a, quite a good publication. Um, you might talk about a Gottlieb ball count unit or replay unit. There's often a link to a video. Well, that's that's probably as Chris Hibbler uh, ask can he use and I said yeah sure you can you know they're there for free um, so with our YouTube videos we get um, like statistics and one statistic tells us that the people that watch our videos are, are all mostly between the ages of 55 to 64 years of age, we get roughly 53% of people watching them. Now, then if you're between 45 and 54, we get about 22%. And 65 and over, we're only getting 21%. So what that says to me is that a lot of older people, 65 plus, are probably, you know, passing away. And... The more, the more people that are into this now are in the, this demographic of 45 to 54 years of age. Now, that's only our channel, of course, but this indicates that we need to do something about it. Well, it does to me anyway. So we get involved um, in training. Now, we, we firmly believe in training, and we run about three training courses per annum maybe four, depending on the amount of people that we want. We showed you earlier on on the veranda that we was purpose-built for training. We've got a television screen. We can show clips and things like that. And uh, we do live training. We've got a whole suite of relays that we show people how to clean and adjust. We talk about how score motors work, both carousel and uh, horizontal ones, and things like that. And those training courses go for about four hours five hours actually now and um, the people come along and yeah we charge them money and all the money we make out of the goat shed doesn't go into our pocket believe me it goes into buying parts like new rubbers and lamps and goodness knows what else we've got a lot of second hand parts out there and um, you heard Graham mention where he's doing a jungle princess well I spoke to him the other day he's finished that then a jungle queen popped up and well and behold, before he's even started the other jungle queen, another jungle queen turned up. And uh, we're in the middle of doing our lightning ball. You may have seen it in the in the video earlier on. We've painted it and we've got a new back glass for it and this and we're ready to we're to get we're doing the play field up now. And um, we've got a pro football in at the moment. We're waiting on a new uh, cabinet repair for that. And uh, we've probably got a Williams winner coming in and uh, a dropper card and I just learnt this morning about an abracadabra now at its uh, mid-October we won't get all that work done it takes us roughly we only work half a day but we do that six days a week because we can't be working on pinball machines all day we go crazy um, I think we're mad enough as it is you know people say we carry a goat with us so that's enough um, when we do other things Graham does his thing I do my thing um, you just can't, we, we could work on them, but he's not a well man. You heard him say he's got issues with his kidneys and he likes to have a rest after lunch and it's good to have a break, you know, and then you go to the pub and the trouble is the goat wants to come. That's the problem. Very bad news. Um, our approach to repairing a pinball machine is we, we want the customer to enjoy the experience. A lot of the machines we get just don't work or specials don't work or they don't they don't even realize that you can get an extra ball and things like that or the bonus count doesn't work down so we we take the head off the machine we take the insert out of that head lay it on the bench and we do the score reels and we do the 
step units in the back. So if it's a multiplayer game, we do the play unit, we strip them right down, we take out the replay unit, because they're always gummy and sticky. You put them all back together. Um, every score rail comes apart, uh, and the match unit comes apart, and we put that back in. Then we take the play field out, sit it in a cradle, strip all the parts off the top of it, clean it down, polish and wax it, then we do turn it over and do underneath. We normally put a new flipper kit in, new pop bumper kit, replace all the lamps and inspect it visually and replace any worn parts, coil sleeves included. Like when we do the score reels, if you've got 16 score reels in a four-player game, every coil sleeve gets replaced. We don't want it to come back. We want the person to be able to enjoy it. Then we take the motor board or the bottom panel out, as some people call it, sit it on the bench, go through the relays, check those all out, clean every relay. A lot of people say you don't need to do that. You don't if you're inexperienced, but you're experienced, we do it. Um, and when we put the machine back together, it generally starts up. And, you know, but often you've got to fix things that, you know, you might have missed a switch on a relay and we troubleshoot. And then we test the machine over about a two-week period on and off to make sure it's going to work. Because sometimes you test it, this machine's great. We'll read the customer, come and get it. All of a sudden, something isn't working right. You've got to recheck it or readjust it. So we do all that. So that keeps us very, very, very busy. And, um, yeah, it, um, it's fun. And if we get a problem we, we can't solve, it, it bothers us or it troubles us, we walk away. Go do something else. Come back and have a think about it, sleep on it. Come back and chat about it the next morning. We get into the shed at 7.30 every morning. And then we say, how about this? How about that? Yep. I thought of this, I thought of that. And we go to the machine and we generally solve the problem. We've had some horrendous problems to fix of late um, and uh, with wiring and, you know, all the wire colours, they go white, particularly if they're left in the sun. So you've got to sit down and, oh, that's a red and white wire and that's supposed to be a grey and white wire. How on earth do you disseminate that? So you've got to do a resistance check through the circuit and find the other end of the wire. So it's all good fun um, and keeps us sane and happy, I think. Do I look sane and happy? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's sort of a day in the goat shed, you know, and, and we have morning tea. We, we have a cup of coffee at 7.30, 20 to 8. We have morning tea at 10. We don't stress. We don't rush. We just take our time. We, we, we're not under anyone's pressure to do anything. When people bring their machine and we say, Mr. Customer, you're going to have this without it for four to six weeks. And that's generally a pretty good thing. So um, we also in, I didn't mention, I come from Newcastle in New South Wales. That's where we live. That's on the east coast of Australia. Uh, the climate's very similar to California here. Only we have far better beaches uh, than the Californians, I'm afraid. Um, so um, we have a pinball association called the Newcastle Pinball Association, which was started back in 2012. And every September we have our pin fest. So we just had one a couple of weeks before I came over. And all people bring their machines in. And this time we had 104 and we raised $25,000 for charity. So that was really, really good. Um, and that was a charity where if people are down in, in their luck, and they can't afford to buy food for their kids, they can go to this place. It's called Survivors or Us. It was a charity selected this year. They'll give them hampers and food vouchers and stuff and help them along the way. So they, they got 25 grand out of that, which was really, really good um, indeed. So that, that pinball f festival started back in... Um, yeah, thank you. It's, um, it's quite a humbling experience. That pinball festival started back in 2012, so that was the, the 13th one we had. Um, so, you know, we had some happy people there for sure and certain, and Graham and I just attend there as the electromechanical mechanics, and there's more solid state stuff there, but we just go to the bar and sit there till someone says, hey, something's wrong, but we generally don't get any problems, um, which is really good. Now, what we really want to talk about now is the future, where all of us here in this room can do something about keeping electromechanical pinballs alive. Um, and that's all I care about. I don't really like playing the modern games, I'm sorry, to those that do. 
Uh, I don't own any. I own nine of my own electromechanicals and the youngest one's from 1970. And just in case anyone's remotely interested, I'll list what I own. I own Tropic Isle, Banker Ball, Aquarius, King of Diamonds, Sing Along, Williams Apollo, Williams Full House, uh, William Soccer from 1964, and I also own, um, I just got in August, uh, the last machine, which is a Williams Magic City from 67. All those machines that I just mentioned, I played as a kid. And uh, they bring back uh, fond memories. Um, so, and we like to keep those memories going for people that have got electromechanical games. So we mentioned training. We're doing these training courses. Um, we've been doing those now for about, I think this is the fifth year, and we've probably put through about, I don't know, um, 60 or 70 students. I, I've, I lost count. So the people come in, we set up, we, we show them everything that they need to know as basic electromechanical repair, and they walk in with no knowledge or some knowledge, and they walk out with a lot of knowledge but probably hor horribly confused because, you know, after four or five hours of people talking, people get restless, you know. Some of you might even be restless sitting in the chair now listening to me. That's okay. <laughs> um, so training is something that we need to do, all of us need to do. Um, we can do that by courses. We can do that by learning and watching YouTube channels such as ourselves, our GoChed one. Um, we do, there's coaching clinic. Now, um, anyone that's here and hasn't had a look downstairs in the in the main room, Mark Gibson from Colorado is here with his fun with pinball exhibition. And if you love electromechanical games, please go and have a look at that. But Mark is also an experienced pinball mechanic and he has, during COVID, when it started back in 2019, 2020, which shut the world down, uh, Mark started here in the States um, a coaching clinic online where we use like a, a platform like Zoom, but it's called Jitsi. People can dial, uh, call up and we solve their problems. He has a number of coaches, very experienced people. Um, besides Mark, there's David Volansky from the um, Pacific Pinball Museum in uh, Alameda. Um, there's Tim Meehan uh, from uh, Seattle. Um, and there's um, myself. And there's a few other guys that hang in. There's a guy called Dave um, from Pennsylvania. Um, and I've probably missed one or two, but people come and go. And But the aforementioned top three as David, Mark, and um, Tim, and, oh, and myself. So they're great, and if anyone has got a problem and they can't solve it, and often people get onto the Facebook groups, ask for help, and they still can't solve it, we say, look, sign up for the next clinic, we'll help you out. And we had a guy just last clinic we did, he had a World Series Gottlieb Wedgehead game. Mark had been trying to help him like remotely, you know, without videoing him and all that sort of thing. And in the end, this guy had this two years, we solved the problem in half an hour. This guy thought that was fantastic. He was elated. He kept on, you know, the accolades he sent us were unbelievable. I think he wanted to marry us all. Um, but, you know, that's the sort of stuff we do to help people out. And um, we do that all the time. Um the other thing we can do, and I don't know if anyone here has got a business, you know, they're a, they run an arcade or, uh, you know, they have machines on site or something like that. Um, you may have an accomplice, you know. For goodness sake, get someone and train them up if you can. Um, we've been looking for someone for a long time, and just by accident, about three months ago, we had this guy bring a pro football to us. And he said, hey, this is really cool. I like seeing inside these things could I come and watch while you do it? And we said, sure, no problem, we can come. And what he did, he, he only works three days a week. He's about 54-year-old, and he's now becoming our apprentice. So now we've got someone, if he sticks at it, and he looks like he's going to, because he's just messaged me f over the last two days, he's just bought three more pinball machines, <laughs> so he's addicted. So this guy, we're training up. We're putting a fair bit of time into him. He's just going to come around and give us his time. And hopefully after about 12 months, he'll become proficient. He's an electric, electrician by trade. And that sometimes helps, sometimes doesn't. Big wires, small wires, you know. 
um, and that's our way of moving forward because as I said you know we're all getting older you know and the the demographics of our uh, YouTube show us that you know there's not many people over 65 watching our videos um, but there's more people you know up to um, up to um, 64 watching them so as I say that sort of suggests to me that you know a lot of people are, are either you know dying and all the people that were pinball mechanics and the designers are pretty well all, you know, gone. Um, I know respectfully there are a few, like John Osborne, he's he's still with us. I'll be visiting John again in a week or so. He was a Gottlieb designer. But what I'm trying to say is there's no experienced people out there. So we need to train more people. We need to impart our knowledge onto people. And we need to make sure that we have the resources in place to be able to get people to fix our electromechanical games. We've got to be ever so thankful to people like the Pinball Resource for make, making parts and, and other suppliers that, that do. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, visiting Steve Young a um, couple of Mondays ago. We, we were in New York City and we jumped on the train and went up to Poughkeepsie and we got to go to his private home and look at his private collection and we got to meet all his staff and see all his all his own personal games and look at all the thousands of parts he's got and the ones that he hasn't got a, got on his website, you know, because he doesn't sort of do that. But this is the sort of thing we need to do. We believe the hobby has a bright future. It has it's it's getting busier and busier for us and I speak to people all over the world, mainly here in America, Canada, UK uh, South Africa, and um, they're all getting busier and busier, but a lot of the people are wanting to retire. You know, just in Pennsylvania recently, uh, I spoke to some guys. They're all in their 70s. They're all about my age, and they're all, the, they're all saying the same. We need to get other people in that can do this work. So I encourage everyone to sort of be able to do so, you know, get someone younger, Train them up if we can and uh, go to courses where you can. And Mark Gibson runs courses here in the States every so often. Uh, if you're interested, try and get to one, you know, because we run them. I don't think there's anyone else here from Australia except the guys I'm travelling with. But, um, yeah, we, we really, really need to do that. Um, I guess expectations could be high there but I'm sure I'm really sure that people are interested in preserving these games um, you know just before I was came on we had uh, the guys from the Pacific Pinball Museum uh, you know they're passionate about preserving them Mike Sheese and Larry Zatarian and those type of guys um, it's absolutely uh, imperative okay well um, have we got any questions anyone like to Know anything about the goat shed? About Spanky? His dating habits? Thank goodness you don't want to know about that. Because I know they're running behind time. Yes. Whenever I watch the videos, I hear the birds and just wonder to know what type of birds are in the background. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, they're, they're mainly uh, cockatoos. Yeah, we... Sulfur crested cockatoos. You'll occasionally hear a kookaburra. And whenever we hear the kookaburra laugh, that means it's going to rain in Australia. Okay? But we don't have any kangaroos hop up the driveway, nor do we have any koalas hanging off the gum trees. Uh, I was going to thank you because I. I do a lot of WPC and stuff, but I finally got into an EM, and uh, your videos were uh, uh, extremely helpful. Uh, and, I, and I haven't even gone through everything because we've just been doing it. But have you done, like, uh, how to read schematics? Oh, okay. Um, that's really important. <coughs> no, we the haven't. the codes on them. Yeah. Because some of it's easy, but then there is the secret hieroglyphics to the codes of, Closed switches, open switches. Yeah. Okay, so if you want to look at a video about schematics, a guy called John Robertson from 
uh, flippers.com in Canada done one, Schematics 101, it's a YouTube. And David Volansky, who was just here earlier on, but he's he's retired uh, for the evening now, he's done one as well. Um, and I think that's available on the Marco Specialties site. I'd have to check with him. We, we've steered away from it simply because we don't have the technical... Like Mark Gibson, he can when we show a schematic, he's got the software to draw the line, and we, we don't have that, so... Yeah, no, but there are quite a number out there. Okay, thank you very much.